captured. And they are so full of wealth. Um, so it's The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Skolshin. If you don't have a copy, I highly suggest you get one. It's an amazing book. And this week, we, um, she talks about casting the burden. And basically, um, she is talking about um, our subconscious mind and how we hold things in our subconscious mind that we not, may not even be aware that we are hanging on to. Or why we react to things until we really look at, wow, where did that reaction come from? And so, it's interesting, I always think that, um, it's interesting how talk series and how talks come up and how my life unfolds and how they go like this. And so it is by no mistake that um, I'm going to talk about casting the burden, and I was in Dallas, Texas this week. So this was on a plaque that I saw um, at Dealey Square. We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather by, than by choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask them for that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility, that we may exercise our strength and wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. John Fitzgerald Kennedy. It was the speech he was to give at noon on November 22nd, 1963. So what does that have to do with casting out my burden? What I realized was, as a eight-year-old, I fell in love with the Kennedys. Because my family, we watched TV all the time. We ate breakfast to um, the Today Show. We watched Chet Huntley and David Brinkley at night. That's where we ate. We ate on TV trays in um, a, a family room in front of the TV. And I loved them. I loved the Kennedys. I loved the whole Camelot thing. I loved Jackie and her pillbox cats. <laughs> You know, and I just, I was wowed by every time words came out of his mouth, they just touched my heart. And I was 11 years old and in sixth grade sitting in a classroom when my teacher came in and you knew something was not right. Because she was crying and teachers don't cry. And she was sobbing. And she said, the president has been stop shot and he is dead. Now, how do you process that as an 11-year-old? And what I realized was I held the state of Texas and the people of Texas responsible in my little mind. How could they do this to my president? And I didn't know any Texans. And I knew nothing about world news or, or anything other than what I saw. But we process things when we're little as they hit us. And that's what I realized when I was going to Dallas, is wow, I have a lot of energy. You know, and some of that had softened because amazingly, when I moved to Santa Fe, I started to realize, wow, I have a lot of people in my community from Texas. <laughs> and I like them. <coughs> little bit of a dichotomy there. How does that happen? Patty's from Texas. Laura Hayes is from Texas. Seven years. Huh? Oh, okay, but your husband's from Texas. You married a Texan. Harriet's from Texas. Pat, Pat, Pat's from Texas. Chris is from Texas. I mean, the whole community around me, and it was like, wow. And so for me, this trip was um, my forgiveness for, uh, to myself for holding people hostage that didn't deserve to be held. You know, they have done an amazing job um, the book depository is now a JFK museum. And you go up to the sixth floor. That is where the museum is. And it is amazing um, the number of people because they celebrated and celebrated. There was a 50th year anniversary last November. 
I don't know that it was necessarily a, a celebration more than a, oh my gosh, 50 years. Don't do the math. Sorry. No. It's okay. I know how old I am. I don't like it. Um, but it's, um, it was amazing to me um, how crowded this was on a Friday. How many people, young and old, still wanted to, um, to honor, if you will, that time in history. And maybe some of them, people my age, wanted some healing to happen. You know, wanted to realize that my 11-year-old um, had no idea what was going on, and it just broke her heart. I remember I shared with, um, with Mo and Alan and Paul, I remember on Sunday, after he'd been shot, sitting in front of the TV, because like, again, that's what we did. And my mom and dad, I, you know, I thought they were in bed, but I think my mom was in the kitchen and my dad was probably playing golf, because that's what he did on Sunday. And I jumped up and ran into the kitchen and screamed at her, oh my, oh my, they shot him. And she's like, Gail, that happened last week. You know, she thought I was kind of having some sort of episode. And I said, no, the other guy. We saw that on TV. When we, if you were watching TV, you saw that happen live. And most of you were my age or a little bit younger. And so it's how do you process those things that happened to you as a child. And then I looked at sitting there um, watching, you know, because they have newsreels and stuff, and thinking, holy moly. You know, you look at today, and then you look at what we lived through in the 60s. All of the turmoil right here in this country. And how that is in your subconscious mind. And that will play out. <coughs> in your life if you don't allow yourself to heal some of that. So it was, uh, you know, like I said, it's one of those trips that you go for, I went to see Queen. <laughs> you know, I wanted to see Adam Lambert knock it out of the park, and he did, by the way. Um, you know, that's why I went to Dallas. I had no idea what that trip was really going to mean to me personally. And so for me, it's really paying attention all the time because I believe things happen in our life. Big things, trips to places. You know, if I hadn't lived in Santa Fe, I probably never would go to Dallas. I had been there one other time on business. I had flown into Dallas and um, I had gone to Plano and done my business and flown out. I hadn't even given a thought to the fact that um, the president had been shot in Dallas. I did not make the connection back then. You know, and this time, I could walk there from the hotel that I picked. And it was uh, Maureen and Alan, because Alan is a lot like Paul. Oh, we're going to Dallas? Let me look online and find out what's there. You know, and so um, they said, you know, we're going to be very close to the grassy knoll. And so, you know, it's, there, there's an X in the middle of the road where it happened. I thought that was a little, um, what I thought was, so this, this is some of the, our humanness that I can go into judgment about. There were literally people who would run out into the middle of this busy intersection when there was no traffic to have their picture taken standing on that X. And I was like, you know, they killed my president in that spot. Please don't stand there and have your picture taken. You know, that's what I thought. Because that was that little girl. Please don't do that. And so it's those things when we clean out our subconscious mind. Those things that we have to go back and look at. Why do I behave the way I behave? And it's those deep-seated things that we think didn't affect us. How many of you lived through the 60s? How many have you, have, have you really looked at how that possibly could affect how you are today? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I do. A lot of the times I don't. Because I just wasn't conscious of, you know, I'm very conscious of my mother, my father, my sister.
cancer, uh, you know, whomever. I'm very conscious of the effect that they have on my life. And I didn't really pay attention to, although I say all the time, be very awake and aware when you watch the news. Because it does affect us. And so for me, although I don't know if it sounds like it, this was a real healing for me. It was a real healing for me to go through the process, to walk up on that grassy knoll, and to run through all the things that I'd heard about, um, you know, growing up and in the time, and all of those emotions that I had around what happened. And so how many things do you have that happen in your life that you kind of brush aside? Like, well, everybody was there. You know, think of 9-11. You know, that is our most recent thing. And where I think it's a little bit different is it, um, it was, you know, at the time it appeared that what happened in Dallas was us hurting each other. Everything that happened in the 60s other than Vietnam it was kind of us imploding as a country, if you will. And so 9-11 um, to me, we had something we could look at. You know, we had another country that we could look at. And still, things like that, we have to own, they affect us at a very cellular level. It's more than just news. It is more than just news. And so what do we do about it? Living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, how do you, um, how do you move through all of the stuff that happens in the news? Because I think we all have compassionate hearts and we all want to do something. And most of us aren't in a position of changing politics or changing it. So what I say to people is, there are a lot of things you can do. You can be that bright light. You know, I honestly believe that the brighter I shine, that vibrates out into the world and that dispels darkness. Yeah. If I buy in the darkness, all I'm doing is feeding the beast. And that comes from, and I've said this before, that comes from me um, getting mad at my neighbor because he smokes cigars outside on his back patio when I want to sit in my hot tub. You know, it's that really, you know, all of that. And so we're here to, all of that is feeding to me that, um, if you will, beast, that, that darkness. And do we get angry? Should we get angry? Every single one of us. If you don't, God bless you, I still get angry. And I have a great spiritual practice and I'm actually doing it on a regular basis. And I still can have a button push. And, I, and my go-to place is not, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks. You know, I, I back up and I bring it on. Because I had 50 years of practice doing that. And I had 12 years of practice of, so what would my compassionate response be? And what I do now is if I jump into, <clears throat> at least I have now the capability to go back and say, I am so sorry that I did that, you know, and to make amends. Whereas before, I didn't think I owed anybody amends. If anybody owed anything, you owed me amends. That's how this whole thing got started in the first place. So, you know, our subconscious mind is the law. Do you understand what that is? On a universal level, when we talk about God in this philosophy, we talk about the law. There is the, the mind of God, there is the law of God, and there's the manifestation of God. It's all one thing, we just do that so we can divide it up. The law of God is that thought that created us all. The, uh, the, I'm sorry, the oneness of God, the mind of God, is that which gave birth to all of us, to all things. The law is that place that anything that goes into it manifests out. It's impressing the law and manifesting out into reality. And then what we see before us is manifestation. On a human form, everything we say, everything we do impresses into our subconscious mind. And so if we're filling our subconscious mind with, I don't like, I should have, this person, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then, and I'm living proof of this, that is what we attract around us. All of those people that are going to support us in our um, disdain of life, if you will. 
You know, I played the victim card really, really well. It was a ship. I wrote it. I was comfortable in it. I was its captain. And what I realized when I broke all of that down and let all that go, then I can create a new life. That's where we get into this change your thinking, change your life. It's your thinking. You're the only one that can change it. I can only change my thinking. And so it's really looking at those opportunities, going to Dallas and really looking at, holy moly, I had no idea. I had no idea that I held a whole city responsible for something none of them had anything to do with. And so it was, it was a nice release for me. It was a nice casting out the burden and letting go. And just, it is what it is. And it was what it was. It happened. And so it's letting go of all of that angst around it. And so I, I look at each one of you and, and ask you to go within and look at where do you feel you're stuck? <clears throat> because I promised you, if you're stuck somewhere, it's in your subconscious mind. There is something there that you can uproot and replace. And it can be just those, you know, little tiny thoughts that you're not even aware of. I forget how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of thoughts that they say we have a day, and we're only aware of maybe 1% of those. And those are the other thoughts. That's where we react from when we're not awake and aware. And so I'd like to close um, with a prayer. And it's a prayer. We have a lot going on this week as a community. For those of you who don't know it, um, you know, Bryn, one of our practitioners, um, was hooked up to a monitor so that they could monitor her heart. And um, when they got the reading on Wednesday, she had flatlined twice in the past 30 days. And so the nurse said, I'm gonna have the doctor come in on Thursday, so even though he's in surgery, I want you to come in, and um, we're gonna talk to the, you know, the doctor will take a break and come in and talk to you. And he walked in and he said, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, you're going into surgery, so Brent now has a pacemaker. Um, Robin Brown, who many of you know, or maybe don't know, she sits probably right where Stephanie is in the orange, um, she was dancing on Saturday night and she fell and broke her kneecap in three places. Oh. Friday night, I'm sorry, Friday night and broke her kneecap in three places. Um, so anybody else have, any, have anything that we're going to, yes? Um, my my mother-in-law uh, was diagnosed with cancer on Friday. Okay. And um, it's pretty serious. Robbie said her nephew's an addict. And my mother and my dad fall on just the medicine that they way back. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So those are spoken and anybody unspoken word. So let's just take a collective breath in. And why don't I do this? Mo, would you stand over there? Patty, would you stand at the back? And Robbie, could you stand on the side of us? everybody in love and life. Let's just take that collective breath in. And so what I know right here, right now, above everything else, above all else, is there is one. There is only one. It is magnificent. It is an energy that surpasses all other energies. It is something I choose to call God, and yet really it has no name at all. It just is. It is what each one of us has been birthed from into this human form. It is love, it is compassion, it is joy, it is health. It is creativity. It is perfect, it is whole, it is complete. And I know that it is in and through and as each and every one of us. And yet in the wisdom of this creation, of the, in the wisdom of this human form, 
we are given free will. And with that free will, we are given choice each and every moment of each and every day. And that choice is ours and ours alone. Some say it's a soul journey. And it is. We chose to be here. We chose to walk this path. And as a community, we chose to do this together. And so what I declare right here and right now is each person that was mentioned, first and foremost, at the soul of who they are, they are whole. They are complete and they are perfect because they are God. They will never feel cancer. They will never know addiction. Their heart, who knows, at a soul level, if a heart is even there. The soul is perfect. The human form, the human form is what it is. And so we come here to learn, we come here to express, and we come here to walk a path together. And so what I uh, declare for Cody is that he feels the love and light of me who has walked that path before. And when he chooses and when he is ready, he can step up and make a new choice and decide to walk a different path. And yet I know at the very soul of who I am and at the very humanness of my addiction, this is his choice and his choice only. And so with all the compassion and love that God has, is as me, I just bless him. Bless him, bless him and know that his time here in Santa Fe has broken away some of that darkness. And it will never be as dark as it has been in the past. And I speak my word for Heather's mother. I know that this journey this, that she is on is devastating not only to her and to her family. There aren't words that are going to make this better. Except what I know is ease and grace and love. And I surround Heather's mother in the knowing that her soul is whole, complete, and perfect. And this path that she is on, we all surround her with love. <clears throat> knowing that she does not travel this journey alone, whatever it is. I speak my word for Bren, knowing that today she woke up and she took the first breath that fell really deep. The first heartbeat that felt really complete. The first time she had a thought that didn't feel fuzzy. I speak my word for Tashima's mother, knowing that a this fall, that the human body is healing and the soul already knows and sends out to every cell a big yes. As a minister, I can't explain these human events. I wish I could. I wish I could say they didn't happen. I wish I could say that young people at 28 don't die unexpectedly. The car wrecks never occur. And yet, what I know is when we live through experiences that take us to our knees, what we have as humans is each other. We have love. <clears throat> we have deep, deep compassion. And we have a knowing in our souls that we are here to reach our hand out and say to each other, I love you, I feel your pain, and I will walk with you until it passes. And so I 
give thanks for this community. I give thanks for the light we bring to the world. Because I know that light has to start somewhere, so why not right here? Thank you, God. <laughs> what a blessing. So knowing this is true, it is spoken, it is done. We release it into the law, and we know that the law immediately shifts consciousness, for the word is that powerful. And so together we say, so it is.